Hello and welcome to the Pastors of Farm Pantry with me, Ellie, and today I'm in the 1930s. Okay, so I want to make a few things clear. Number one, the outfit. I don't know what the 1930s looks like, it turns out, and even after I googled, for days and days, apparently nobody else can tell me what the 1930s looks like. So I've gone with a generic evening dress that is two sizes too small for me and doesn't do up at the back, um, gloves and a fur trimmed cape on the hottest day of the year. The second thing I'd also like you to appreciate and notice is how I've done my hair because the one thing that I could Google is these waves. So um, just so you know, I've had to really work hard to get this effect and I've had to draw it on in eyeliner underneath so if it all goes a bit messy and you think oh my god she's literally got a massive black gash across her head that's eyeliner because my hair's moved. Second thing you'll also be thinking is that I've come up with some sort of rash. No, apparently women of the 1930s loved their blusher. I don't have any blusher so I very wisely use bright red eyeshadow instead. This is the effect. Anyway, the 1930s. I didn't know, oh, do you know it's so hot I'm taking these off. I didn't know about the 1930s very much at all. So it's one of these decades that I think we know about because it's on the eve or the cusp of World War II. In schools we teach a lot about Germany in the 1930s and Hitler's rise to power, but Britain in the 1930s was a little bit of an enigma to me. Obviously the 1930s starts off quite poorly with the Wall Street crash in 1929, but that is something that has a global effect, you know, Wall Street crash, economic depression, global recession, and it affects America particularly badly. But Britain doesn't suffer the, the same level of knock-on effects, partly because our industry hadn't really recovered to the same level post-World War I. So when the Wall Street crash happened, we had, I guess in a way, a little bit less to lose. Now, that's obviously not to say that we weren't affected at all, we were, and industries particularly that were affected included um, industries with like steel, manufacturing, anything that relied on exporting goods, obviously global recession, no one's going to be that interested in buying from other countries. So if you worked in steel or iron or anything like that, you were affected, particularly in the north of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and in Jarrow in particular as well, in 1934, unemployment rates reached 67%. So economic decline was obviously the looming silent backdrop to this decade, but also it was a decade of change. It wasn't just about suffering and poverty. And with the decline of these big Edwardian industries came the way for new sleeker modern industries. BBC Radio, created in 1927, really really sees its popularity peak in the 1930s. And by 1937, approximately 20 million Brits are going to the cinema every week. Hardly the activities of people that are suffering, you know, universal economic gloom. And in the kitchen, there were also great strides. So things like convenience food, sliced bread, invented in 1930, along with Kellogg's cornflakes brought over from America in the 1930s. Huge, huge improvements to the life of the housewife who before this usually had to bake their own bread, slice their own bread and, you know, just generally cook like that. It cut out hours of preparation. So I know it's no microwave meal, but it is convenience food. And with more convenience comes more free time. And in 1938, the government introduced the Holidays with Pay Act. And this gave working class families on minimum wage at least one week of paid holiday every year. The first time for many of these people that they had had any sort of paid holiday. It wasn't much, but it was a start. And entrepreneurs like Billy Butlin were very, very savvy about kind of making money from this newly liberated working class dollar and set up holiday camps, which he hoped people with newfound free time would flock to. And flock they did. The first Butlins was opened in Skegness in 1936 and it was aimed at families on a budget. So it provided kind of all-inclusive wraparound entertainment, food, accommodation. You had these chalets so you could, you know, cook your own meals, but there were also, for the very, very first time, the opportunities to eat out in a way that people hadn't eaten out before. I can just imagine the excitement of it for you know, thousands of people, never been on holiday before, packing their suitcase for the first time. Have they got enough pants? Have they got books? Have they got clothes? Have they got enough pants? It's the thing that we all worry about the most, isn't it? Or 
maybe that's just me, I don't know, anyway. But the excitement of packing your suitcase for the first time was absolutely huge and these people loved their holidays. Seaside resorts were also really popular and none more so than Blackpool with its reputation for that famous pier and also really good, clean, cheap family fun. And what else did Blackpool have? Well, a bloody great big shopping centre is what. In 1938, Woolworths opened its newly extended store on the seafront, the first of its kind and the largest in the world at the time. But it wasn't the reasonably priced goods that shoppers were flocking to, or even the legendary pick and mix. No, because on the top two floors of this Woolworths were restaurants. The first Woolworths restaurants had been opened in 1907, but they tended to cater to the shopper out and about for their day, rather than for tourists. The Woolworths restaurants at Blackpool catered for those who were staying on holiday and were maybe a little bit fed up of the offerings at their B&B. They opened from dawn to 11pm and offered breakfast, lunch, dinners, as well as you know picnic lunches and snacks throughout the day. And these menus weren't just cheap rubbish. They had a range to rival even the most fancy London hotel restaurants. And, most importantly to the clientele, they were cheap. A lunch of roast beef and Yorkshire pudding would cost you six pence, and chucking in a pudding you could get for an extra threepence. That's the equivalent of getting a full Sunday dinner with dessert for about £3.50. And if you were feeling really flush, you could ask for an extra cup of tea as well for the princely sum of twopence, about 50p. Two course meal and a hot drink for under a fiver. Starbucks, are you listening? Because I paid a fiver the other day for a cup of warm piss and the driest chocolate cake I've ever had in my life. Sort yourself out and pay your taxes. Anyway, dining out did not stop at Woolworths. The elite had enjoyed being wined and dined for, you know, decades before the 30s, but now the middle classes were joining them for the first time. In fact, by 1937, London newspapers were reporting that it was becoming impossible to book a table anywhere, and that if you were lucky enough to get a table at a restaurant, savvy business owners, who reckoned they could make a quick buck, were packing tables and chairs so tightly in that even if you could sit down to eat, it was not comfortable. But despite the enthusiasm for eating out, there was also real trepidation. Many people who hadn't eaten at restaurants before simply did not know how they worked. What if there was nothing that they liked on the menu? How do you order your food? And the main problem that people seemed to be having was that all of these fancier restaurants, everything tended to be written in French. This was of course considered extremely fashionable or deeply unpatriotic depending on who you spoke to. In the 1930s, the bystander reported that the host of the Catford Greyhound track said that he would rather die than serve any foreign food at his club. Others at the time commented that they felt it was humiliating to be seated by a waiter with a slightly hoity-toity attitude, only to call him back two minutes and have him translate everything on the menu. But despite these slightly xenophobic attitudes, people still wanted to learn the fashionable French ways. But in a world without Duolingo, how do you do that? Enter Ambrose Heath, actual name Francis Geoffrey Miller, a food writer and journalist. He published Dining Out, How and What to Order in 1936 as a bit of a how-to guide for people who didn't really know what they were doing with restaurants. And in his foreword he says that this was intended to be read by businessmen preparing to take out potential clients to dinner so that they could act like they were at home in this kind of very formal setting. Equally, he suggested that potential suitors read it before taking their dates out to dinner to create a civilised, sophisticated impression so that they could order the French dishes without missing a beat and therefore charm the pants off their lucky dinner date. It was, as Heath claimed, the first book of its kind, primarily because there'd never really been a call for it before the 30s. So, in order of all of those brave dining pioneers who bravely ordered beef bourguignon without really knowing what it was, who with confidence and ignorance asked what was on the plat de jour, and in recognition of the lady who was reported by the Nottingham Post in 1929 as refusing to dine out out of fear that she might witness somebody eating snails, this one's for you. Today's menu is a genuine 1930s restaurant menu. Caglino's, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, was a very, very fashionable elite London restaurant. People such as Prince Edward and Wallace Simpson spent time there, drinking, dancing, socialising and, I don't know, maybe if there was time after, sympathising with Nazis a little bit. 
I don't know. The point is, it was where you were meant to be if you were anybody in British society in the 1930s. So Caglino's menu of the 1930s, and this one is from 1939, is not the menu that your Woolworths diners would be eating or your average you know, working class or middle class household of the 1930s. But despite that, it represents a lifestyle that is becoming more attainable to most people during this decade. So I hope you'll join me as I dine in true restaurant style in my very tight dress and my very hot cape on the hottest day of the year in the 1930s. Enjoy. So obviously I didn't have the ingredients for Caglino's menu, so I've actually kind of recreated it from the works of Marcel Boussin, who was a very, very renowned, very famous French chef during this time and who published multiple works, one such as Simple French Cooking, um, one what shall we eat today? I think it's called, or 365 recipes. Um, these were published towards the end of the 20s into the 1930s. And given that, obviously, the 1930s, uh, the elite are dining in French style, I don't think it's too much of a, a far-fetched leap to assume that the recipes that appear in Marcel Boustin's works are going to be similar to the dishes that are served at elite restaurants. To make Quaglino's Consomme Magdalene Frappe, you will need a tablespoon or two of lean beef, 400 millilitres beef consomme, you can use shop bought or make your own, check out my 1900s videos for instructions, one egg white, one tomato. Put the consomme into a pan. Slice the beef into tiny pieces and add to the pan. Dice the tomato and add it to the pan. Whisk the egg white until firm peaks and spoon carefully into the rest of the mixture. Bring to the boil. It will look disgusting and then allow to simmer for one hour. Strain it, never minding that it looks like something that came out of a drain, through a muslin cloth and sieve. The starter. Now, Ambrose Heath would hate me for this because this is a cold soup and in his book, he says that when putting a menu together, if you're going to host a dinner party, you need to make sure that all of your courses match each other. And he uses the example of cold soup as something not to serve if you are going on to serve a hot main. So I've already messed up there for him. I have to say, it looks beautiful. It's like this rich amber colour. Um, I'm a little bit worried because it is, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's just going to be like cold, slightly jelly-like beef stock. But let's have a see. Um, the tomato is a lot stronger than I thought it would be, but it's like an essence of tomato, if you like a memory of tomato, rather than a clear tomato flavour itself. It's not unpleasant. If anything, it's the cold is off-putting. I think this would be nicer warm, but it's not unpleasant. It is very rich. It is not overpoweringly beefy. It is quite nice and cool and chilled. I certainly wouldn't eat all of this in one sitting, but it's, it's very pleasant. It's very refreshing, but I do think it would be better warm. So maybe Ambrose Heath is right. On to the main. To make Aguillette de Boeuf Bouilly à la Flamande, you will need parsley, beef dripping or butter, salt and pepper, two potatoes, one beef rump steak and two or three rashers of thick bacon, two carrots, one onion, half a cabbage. Peel the potatoes and dice them. Heat the dripping in a pan and add the potatoes to it and fry. Slice the beef into thin strips and set to one side to rest. Peel and dice the onion and add it to the potatoes. Peel and slice the carrots finely along with the cabbage and add to boiling water. Slice the bacon and add it to the potato and onion to fry for 5 minutes. Add the slices of beef and sprinkle with salt, pepper and chopped parsley. Cook on each side for no longer than two or three minutes. Oh, 
Okay, so this is something that I am looking forward to eating because it did smell lovely as it was cooking. This is something that I've had to kind of cobble together from my very, very bad GCSE French and Marcel Boussin's instructions and the guides in Caglino's menu. So as far as I can work out, Aliettes, ag aguillettes, is thin strips of beef. Beef bouilli, again, sorry, I'm so sorry if there's anyone French watching, um, is I think maybe like boiled beef or something like that, but it's, it's rump steak, it has to be good quality, so rump steak beef in strips. Marcel Boussin's has a recipe for beef bouilli saute, so obviously that's the frying version which I've used here. And in Caglino's menu it's served à la flamande, which according to Ambrose Heath means with carrots, cabbage and bacon. So that's what we've served it with. Let's see. Mmm. Mmm. That is, that is lovely. The steak is quite peppery and it's not tough, it's still quite pink in the middle. Really, really nice. The potatoes are meaty and slightly crispy and a bit smoky almost, really, really good. And then salty because you get the bacon hits and the oniony kind of aftertaste, if you like, that gives it a little bit of a hmm, piquancy. Um, and then you've got carrots and cabbage, which I know boiled boring, but actually work quite nicely because the rest of it is so rich and deep and textured that having that kind of lighter, simpler side dish works very, very nicely. So this, mwah, bon. <sighs> to make sabayon, you will need three egg yolks, 30 ml Cointreau and 30 ml brandy, and 60 grams of caster sugar. Separate the yolks from the whites and add the yolks to a heat-proof bowl. Add the sugar and alcohol and then heat a pan of water until simmering. Place the bowl in the water to create a bain marie and then whisk the mixture constantly until it thickens or reaches ribbon stage. When it has thickened, plunge the bowl with the sabayon into a bowl of ice water to prevent the mixture from cooking any more and serve. Okay, so here's my sabayon, or if you're a Brit in 1930s, I'm sure of eating out, sabi on. And I was a little bit wary of this because egg yolks, are they gonna be cooked? Ah, la, la, la. But I think that I've done it right. I think it's basically like the Italian, again, I'm so sorry if there's any Italians watching this as well. Sabaglioni? Oh God, um, but it's instead of dessert that's eaten today, basically. The difference is that instead of Madeira, which I think goes in the modern version, this obviously uses brandy and then an orange liqueur. Now, in the uh, Boustine recipe, he, or Boustine recipe rather, he um, advises using Caraco, but I don't have that and it was really expensive to get a bottle in for essentially you know, 30 mils. So I've used Cointreau instead, which we did have in, and which will give a similar, I think, flavour, because it's the orangey hit you want. So I'm not sure whether you're supposed to eat this with a spoon or a biscuit, but I'm, I'm gonna go with a strawberry. Nice and simple. Mm. Mm. That's so good. I worried that it would be a little bit overpowering with the amount of alcohol in it, but it's not at all. It's like a, or maybe it is, and it's just deceptive, but it's like a nice orangey back flavor. It's just very creamy and rich and decadent. And yes, this is very, very nice. Mmm. I could eat a lot of this. Delicious. All in all, a great night out, I'd say. So that's it for the 1930s. Except it's obviously not. It would be wrong not to mention the very final years of the 1930s when obviously World War II began. And in Britain, I do think that sort of through the mid 30s and then into the late 30s, especially for the middle class and the elite, and for kind of working class people as well with their holidays, there was a sense of newfound freedom and newfound finances that maybe they'd not had before. But when 1939 came and Chamberlain's white paper had been proved to be nothing more than a, you know, an empty promise, and, and Britain declared war on Germany, I think 
For a lot of people, suddenly, the lifestyle they had just begun to grow accustomed to ended with quite a rude thud. And, you know, these decadent meals, these, well, as we'll see in the 1940s, these very, very uh, extravagant, lavish ingredients, menus, options to people are just cut. And we go into an era of rationing and we continue in that era of rationing long after World War II actually ends. So it's, it's kind of heartbreaking because with hindsight, I know what's coming for my next video and for the next decade. So I've enjoyed this decade so much. You know, everything has been pretty delicious. That pudding is, is amazing. And I feel kind of heartbroken that I know that these people just going out to discover these desserts, just going out to discover these main courses, this kind of way of lifestyle, and it's all gonna come to an end really, really quickly, almost as soon as it started. So it is obviously a lovely decade to experience for me, but it's maybe a decade that is tinged with a little bit of foreboding, with a bit of sadness, because I can imagine how much fun people are having and how quickly that fun ended, especially after having just got over the horrors of World War One. You know, there are going to be some people who very much still remember World War One, and the idea of another war is going to be horrific to them. So, with that in mind, and with slight trepidation, I hope you will join me for the 1940s video that I'll do next, and I hope that you've enjoyed this video of the 1930s, and join me next time on The Past is a Foreign Pantry. Bonsoir, madame. What's good? Escargot. Mm, no, 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 to eat in. Snacks, can I just have chicken and chips? Yes. Your favourite Daniel? Bon appetite!